I understand you're a surfer. I guess that's true, yes. <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be a surfer. <laughs> I hope they have waves in heaven because I really would like to take up surfing. I think that would be fun. I have been blessed by being here today. The music has been special. Amen. From the praise singers, the violin. Now, I, I'm, I'm searching for that, that beautiful violin. And what you played during the offering uh, was my father's favorite song. So it brought back special memories. And Deidre, that was just divine. And tell it. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. It is a pleasure to be with you today. On behalf of my work family, many of who are here today, I want to uh, greet you this Sabbath morning. We have invited members of my work family, and it really is special to have many of you here, so welcome to you. My thanks also to Pastor Shafter. Um, as we have been working together when he was appointed as pastor here and we had a chance to get acquainted and started working on the Christmas store idea, I just, I, that, that's exciting to me. It's very exciting to me. And we're grateful for your daughter. And by the way, during Sapa school, I learned that your daughter's name is Wendy. Thank you that you know Wendy and that Wendy is a member of the New Day Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, that video, I have, sh I have seen it and I have shared it with my team as we introduced the concept of the Christmas store and I am just so grateful for the way that is shaping up to be. Thanks also to Lynn and to Deborah for their work on uh, leading the church side of it. I want to thank all of you who may not have volunteered yet, but I hope you do volunteer because I'm going to volunteer my time. This is something very, very special, and I want to thank you for being willing to come and help us as we uh, share Christmas with 20 families. And then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't say something to Wendy and her family because she's leading the uh, charge. The two Wendy's kind of, you know, this is great, the, the Wendy bookends that are helping to make the Christmas store idea very special. Because I believe that the 20 families that will be chosen will benefit from our efforts, will have a chance to see firsthand what it means to experience unconditional love. Just like I believe that countless people who experienced that as they interacted with Jesus as he went about preaching, teaching, and healing. The last time I stood in this pulpit for the sermon, we talked about the mission of extending the healing ministry of Christ, and I shared with you that our purpose was to honor God through the care we provide our community. And in the couple of years since then, we have been working hard to improve the care, and I am pleased with the progress that is being made. Today, I would like to talk to you about a journey. It's just as exciting, in my opinion, as the journey that you just took to Hawaii. That, 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 that's special. My wife and I, actually, our first job out of college, we went to Hawaii. We worked at Castle Medical Center. And I have been many times to the island of Kauai. And uh, just love that. So, But a journey nonetheless, and that journey is a Healthcare transformation. And the topic, frankly, is particularly relevant in light of the fact that we recently announced that Advent Health was going to be our new name. So we're transfer, transforming Adventist Health System 
to Advent Health. Growing up, my identity was wrapped up on the church side of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My father and both of my grandfathers were Seventh-day Adventist ministers. My father was born in Havana, Cuba of missionary parents. My mother was born in Guatemala for the same reason. My grandfather, Harry Larrabee, is buried in San Jose, Costa Rica. He was killed in a tragic plane crash while he was serving as a missionary in Central America when my mother was 17 years old. I never had a chance to meet my grandfather, but I have visited his grave. My mother, the uh, already said that. As a child, I was raised in Panama, Mexico, and Puerto Rico, also by missionary parents. It was kind of cool. My father born in Cuba of missionary parents. My mother in Guatemala of missionary parents. They returned and they raised us. I was born in Texas, but had a chance to learn Spanish in Panama, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. Don't mess with Texas. <laughs> The work we dedicated ourselves to was telling the good news about the second advent of Jesus. My family has invested significantly in the great advent movement. Sharon and I, my wife, met at Southern Adventist University, known at the time as Southern Missionary College. In some circles, it was known as Southern Matrimony College. <laughs> I'm just saying. Scott and I both met our wives at Southern. Anybody else here meet their wives at Southern or spouses at Southern? A great place to get a wife, by the way. In 1976, when Sharon and I finished our education and started work, we started our career in Adventist healthcare in Hawaii. Many of my friends on the church side, when they heard that I was going to be working in the health system, told me that they felt that the right arm of the gospel, which is what the healthcare work is known as, was withered. And that we were not living up to our potential for good. I also heard from some that they felt that we had lost our way and the ministry of healing that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was known for had become big business and nothing more. It made me sad when I heard that. But I purposed in my heart that I would do what I could to make that right arm of the gospel strong. Today, 42 years later, as I make plans to retire at the end of the year, I'm really happy with the progress that the health system has made. And I believe that those out there that might have felt that the right arm of the gospel or that the ministry of healing was not what it needed to be, we've convinced them otherwise. Because I believe we are better. We are getting used to the name Advent Health, aren't we? I kind of like it. The more I use it and think about it, the better I feel about the, what the name Advent means. The word Advent has significance to both Christians and non-Christians alike. It signals the arrival of something or someone of great significance. I'm going to ask that we pass out these uh, little books now, one per family. I have 42 of them, and I think we should be able to, to get them in everybody's hand. But this is the basis of my talk today, my conversation with you. And I would love for you to have a chance to follow along. So as those come forward, uh, and uh, you have a chance to pull out your copy, I'll invite you to turn to the second page where we'll be uh, taking up this discussion.
heart of the Seventh-day Adventist faith is the hopeful anticipation of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The great advent that will bring ultimate restoration, healing, and wholeness. And at the bottom there of page two, I love what it says when it reads, the Advent health story is one of hope. It tells how God created us, how Christ's ministry on earth restored us from our brokenness, and how the promised return of Jesus Christ signals our ultimate restoration. The hope of this eternal promise is infused in the way that we provide care to our communities. When Terry Shaw, the CEO of Adventist Health System, began as the CEO, he posed a challenge to all of us to remove the word discharge from our vocabulary. Why might you say? What he said is that the only places where the word discharge is used is in the military or in the hospital. Aside from a disgusting medical term, which I'm not going to get. <laughs> hospital Sabbath, but we don't have to be disgusting. As I think about our text in Matthew 4.23, I can't imagine that Jesus ever discharged somebody from his care. He never washed his hands of those he taught or healed. And by way of illustration, I would draw your attention to the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Normally, when we talk about that story, it's usually in reference to the faith of that, that little boy who shared his lunch that day with so many people. And while that's a great lesson, it's not the one that I would like to focus on today. Instead, I want to bring into focus the tendency or the mindset of the disciples. So the feeding of the 5,000 story is, frankly, in every one of the Gospels. All four of them. In Matthew chapter 14, if you're following along, Matthew references that Jesus was healing the sick. So we know Matthew was really impressed with the healing that Jesus did. Um, in, in Mark chapter 6, Mark describes that Jesus started to teach the people. It doesn't say that there was healing that went on, but he said that teaching went on. So Mark was more impressed with the teaching part of that. Luke says that Jesus taught them things about the kingdom of God and healed as many as needed to be healed. But none of the three of those reference the little boy whose lunch was used for that miracle. It's only the work of John who actually describes this incident as a test of faith that Jesus was trying to use with Philip. And John also is the only one that focuses on the little boy. In all these passages, though, there is one common theme, and that is how the disciples were ready to discharge the people, to send them away into the surrounding villages so that they could buy food. But Jesus told them, feed the people. That, I believe, this business of not discharging people was the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. I also believe it's the lesson that Terry Shaw was trying to teach us as we lead the care.
care efforts of those we are privileged to serve. And I can still see, hear him saying, stop discharging people, help them transition to the next level of care. They should never leave our care. I love that. I'm excited about that. would invite you to turn to page number four in the book. Built into our legacy is the belief in the wholeness our Creator intended for His creation, and that Christ's healing ministry is about restoring wholeness to people. Christ gives salvation and will return someday to fully restore us into whole beings. This legacy of wholeness is powerful. We're not there just to treat the gallbladder, we're there to restore wholeness. We seek to restore wholeness in broken people who come to us for care. On page six, it talks about our Adventist heritage. And our Seventh day Adventist DNA is intertwined with care for the sick and the poor as well as the rich and the famous. I learned recently that John Harvey Kellogg, a physician, an early pioneer in our Seventh-day Adventist health work, went out of his way to care for the poor. He had a heart for caring for those who were disadvantaged. It is said that he worked with the Pacific Garden Mission, the people who developed the unshackled radio program. He worked with them to establish a clinic in downtown Chicago that was dedicated to care for the poor. We may not agree with everything that Dr. Kellogg believed because later in his life he went into the theory of pantheism and I don't believe that that is biblical but I like the fact that he started us on the track in the health message of focusing on those who were poor. And I'm grateful that that's part of who we are. The very bottom there on page seven, it reads, as we unify our healthcare system under the name Advent Health, we return to our roots and anticipate Christ's return, the Advent that will bring ultimate healing and wholeness. A couple of weeks ago, a local pastor by the name of Jeffrey Dove. Pastor Dove is the pastor of the Allen Chapel, and that is the African Methodist Episcopal Church here in New Smyrna. He attended a ministerial luncheon that Scott and I hosted for our pastors, and in that setting, he went out of his way to praise the hospital for the way that we were helping their church teach creation health to the homeless. He also said that we had done things that he hadn't been able to get any other healthcare system to do to overcome those barriers that keep us from being able to serve the homeless. Imagine for a moment that you are responsible for the registration process at the hospital, okay? So you've got your desk and somebody comes to you that wants to register for care and you start through the questions. Name, address. And for address, they tell you in the woods behind the shopping center. How do you put that in the electronic record that we maintain. In our case, the way we handle that is because we've been working with the Allen Chapel, they have asked that we put their church address. So now the homeless that we're working with have an address. A small thing, maybe, but it's really turned out to be a big deal, a big deal. 
Speaking of creation health, the last time I was here, I talked a great deal about it. In fact, I even brought up, remember the, the, the case of, of, of uh, literature and, and books on creation health? And I wanted to give you a brief update on how that amazing outreach tool is working. It is, creation health is impacting our care that we provide at the bedside across all of Adventist Health System. It is helping us improve the health of our employees, and it is being used to improve the health status of the population that we, were, we are at risk for. Creation Health is now used in 89 countries around the world. It has been translated into 10 languages. Awesome. It is being used by 186 preschools, 110 high schools, and many of our Seventh-day Adventist universities and colleges are using it as part of their curriculum. Our message of health and wholeness is resonating with the world we serve. I invite you to turn on to page 8, where you'll see that creation health is our philosophy for delivering whole person care and living as we were created to live, drawing from the legacy of our Seventh-day Adventist founders. I love that that's in there. On page 10, by the way, isn't that picture opposite? Isn't that amazing? That looks like a, a, a drawing, but it, it, it's amazing. That apparently, that is the way that that mountain, and I don't know where it is, I love to find it because that may need to get on the bucket list of where I go to look at it. <laughs> on page 10, the Adventist Health System mission adopted by every institution under the new Advent Health banner is extending the healing ministry of Christ. Our new brand promise is feel whole. Our work and mission are rooted in the idea that we live in a broken world between the garden and the new earth where we are able to help people feel whole we believe health should be measured in terms of the whole person mind body and spirit turning the page you'll see the text on the opposite page john 10 10 I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Our values reflect our desire to honor God through the care we provide our community. And so another way of saying that is that our values guide our conduct. They shape the way that we build relationships with those inside and outside of the organization. Our values align us around a common set of beliefs and standards and not only inform our work, but also should guide our behavior. As members of the hospital church, and I love the way you referenced that, as members of the hospital church, I would love for you to have a sense of what our vision what our values, and what our service standards are. So allow me to please go through those. These are part of our core work. So our values on page 14, quality and service excellence. Anybody have a problem with that? How do we honor God if our quality and service is not excellent? High ethical standards. You okay with that one? We're a faith-based organization. We should have high ethical standards. Community well-being. Don Jernigan, before he retired, I can still hear him saying, gentlemen and ladies, I want you to find the intersection of doing good and doing well, looking for the well-being of the communities that we serve. Stewardship and inclusiveness round out those values. Our vision on page 16, you can see we're going pretty quick now through this. On page 16, influencing our vision is the text in Jeremiah 29, 7. 
Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. With Christ as our example, we care for and nurture people, our team members, our communities, our healthcare professionals, professionals, and those who trust us for care and healing. Our vision is more simply expressed in these five dynamic concepts. And we're going to go into a little more detail on page 18. Holistic, helping engage the consumer to feel whole. Exceptional, striving to improve our product and people systems to become the benchmark for performance and experience. Connected, providing care and services in an expanded network that is easy for the people that we serve. Affordable, and by the way, we know that healthcare is not affordable in this country. We've got to do something about it. And that's why it's part of our vision. We've got to make it affordable. Affordable. We are on a journey to lower the cost of providing care. And then finally, the word viable. Driven by our value of stewardship, it is our responsibility to ensure that we are able to operate efficiently, make investments to better serve and provide services to our communities, and adapt to changes that occur in the marketplace. Moving on to page 20, I love the text there, John 1, 4, and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not or has not overcome it. Our desire is that every person that walks through our doors across all of our facilities and care locations experiences an exceptional and consistent level of service. And we call it the whole care experience because candidly it was what we trained our employees to do. 80,000 of us across all of Adventist Health System went through this same training. And in that training, we learn some service standards that are referenced on page 22. The first service standard is keep me safe. Frankly, just like with Ford, that's job one, safety. In our particular case, it is our number one priority. The second service standard is love me, and I've highlighted uncommon compassion. Make it easy is the third service standard. Help guests to their destination and speak highly of others are the two that I highlighted. And then own it, follow through on commitments is the one that uh, I took to heart. On page 25, you will find the imperatives, our core work, engage the consumer, improve people systems, improve the product, Expand the network. By the way, we're not just a system of hospitals. We're a system of care. Lower the cost and manage the risk. On page 26, there's a picture of a mighty tree. Our brand promise, Feel Whole, is much like a mighty tree. When you see the tree on the horizon, it defines the landscape. And then you see the root system is our mission and our values. Our vision is the trunk of the tree. The branches are our imperatives. And our initiatives are the leaves. On page 29, the reference to greater as a whole. Our work depends on a strong culture. Just yesterday in our safety huddle, I shared with our leadership team the importance of the culture that they allowed as leaders. If our focus is how do we serve the 
community in a way that honors God means we've got to put our patients first. And if they encounter anything that keeps them from being able to follow through with that commitment, they need to help me figure out a way to fix that. We talked about the culture and the importance of that. And we are moving away, as I said earlier,